let's talk a little bit about Venus TOS um, and the management. So I'm going to I'm going to pick on some people who I recognize. So one of the uh, so if someone has uh, comes in with upper extremity DVT, uh, young person, active person, you suspect venous TOS based on the history, all those sort of history and clues that Dr. Matto has talked about. Um, what's the initial uh, What's the initial treatment? Anita. Hmm? Lysis. And then w what do you do from there? So let's say lysis over the course of two days. Lysis too? Okay. All right. You said you were just talking about getting the rib out. I was going to I was going to cover the periphery around it. All right, very good. Oh, hey, what do you know? With that, with I'm done. Thank you. I I'm I, I'm very intuitive when it comes to segways. Here we go. All right, so sorry for that. So again, uh, I have no relevant uh, financial disclosure. And again, uh, Carl Ellig, my partner, does the majority of our TOS. But we do have a, you know, we've all done it over the years. And um, I think the process and, you know, sort of talking about these patients every week, uh, we do all get a fair amount of TOS education. So, uh, you know, as Mark talked about, TOS in general is most likely neurogenic, but venous TOS and specifically, you know, one to two patients per 100,000, but that means in the U.S. between three and 6,000 patients a year. So plenty to go around. Now, majority of these people do get sent to referral centers, but, you, you know, in practice, you're certainly going to come across the acute venous TOS patient. Um, again, patients are typically younger than our average arterial disease patient. Uh, for venous TOS, unlike the neurogenic, it is a slightly higher male to female uh, ratio. And because most people are right-handed, you know, and it's related to repetitive activity, it's more likely on the right. Um, if you look at these patients typically present, and they will report a history of either vigorous activity or, or um, sort of an you know, whatever they do for work that uses um, their upper extremity. You know, we see a lot of athletes, pitchers, hockey players, uh, swimmers, tennis players. I operated on a kid a few years ago, he was 16. He was uh, um, you know, into all kinds of activity, rowing. You know, so it depends really. I think you know, just repetitive activity uh, in general. Uh, and sort of uh, because of the anatomy, so the vein runs between the rib, the clavicle, and is compressed by the muscle. Um, the anterior scalene and the subclavus muscle, and this repetitive trauma to the vein that gets injured, uh, like the picture that uh, Mark Maddow showed. Uh, again, vocation and avocation. So, you know, if you're a golfer or a baseball player, we see a lot of pitchers, um, you know, just repetitive trauma. Uh, and, and maybe, maybe not hypercoagulable states. I mean, it's sort of worth looking at. If there really is no activity related, then you should probably look for hypercoagulability. Uh, and here's the anatomy, so clavicle, here's the vein, here's the first rib, here's your subclavius muscle, here's your anterior scalene. Oop, um, so, you know, so you can see the triangle and where the vein um, and artery and, and the brachial plexus will get compressed. So they present, you know, with a big swollen sort of blue arm, heavy, uh, typically quite profound if it's acute, right? Because if it's, you know, if it's chronic, it's not like the dialysis patients that develops sort of slowly over years, and that's the other population where we see this a fair amount uh, is, in the, is in the dialysis patients. Um, some people believe that it's from uh, indwelling catheters, but it's probably also related to the hyperdynamic flow and injury to the vein wall over time. Um, <clears throat> but we won't talk that much about that today. Um, there will be, you'll see blue collaterals, you know, big veins across the chest wall. Uh, and it can be, you know, chronic. If it's completely occluded, then it'll be all the time. Or it could just be intermittent. You know, after you know, activity, they'll get a swollen arm and it gets better. That's the stenosis that's not completely thrombosed. Um, and typically, if there's acute thrombosis, uh, almost all those patients is 85 percent. But almost all those patients will be profoundly symptomatic. And that's sort of a, you know, typical presentation there. So. Uh, if you do a venogram, which almost all of these patients need, because if you're going to treat them properly, then you're going to address the venous abnormality and, and do thrombolysis or, or intervene on the vein. So 
Uh, and you'll typically see this compression and occlusion of this vein at the caustic clavicular junction, large collaterals either draining into the jugular or the azagous or hemiazagous system. Uh, so what's the proper treatment, right? Not DV, it's not a DVT, right? So this isn't, should not be treated, uh, and this is common, right? You know, the patients will come to us, they've been started on Coumadin, and, and no intervention. You really want to get the thrombus out, you want to do thrombolysis, uh, and then <clears throat> depending on sort of, uh, you know, what program you're at and what your sort of algorithm is, you know, decompress the, the first rib. Uh, and the, the, the earlier you do the thrombolysis, the better. So, you know, there's the many, if you look at uh, the old Hopkins literature, uh, by the time the patients were referred to Julie Freischleg, it had been three, six, nine, you know, 15, 18 months since they initi initially had, a, had their symptoms uh, and they were put on anticoagulation and not treated properly. So the initial treatment should be thrombolysis in almost all cases. <clears throat> How do you make the diagnosis? Ultrasound is, is pretty accurate, so high sensitivity, high specificity. Um, but if you can get fooled, sometimes the collaterals are so large that if you're not really um, familiar with what you're looking at, you'll be like, oh, this flow there, everything's open, and it's really just a big collateral. Uh, so you really want to have a dedicated person that knows what they're looking for. Uh, and if you don't see something and, you, and you're suspicious, then you want to do positional imaging to see that compression. Uh, CTMR, questionable. I think it works well. Uh, certainly for the arterial venous, if it's got the proper phase uh, of contrast, it uh, can be quite diagnostic. Uh, but again, almost everybody needs a venogram uh, if you are going to intervene. So this, uh, you know, here's your venogram, looks relatively normal, and with abduction, uh, you see compression at the caustic clavicular junction. So first therapy, right, the principles here are get rid of the clot. Lys and lysis works well. Uh, and then get rid of the source of compression, which is the first rib, the subclavius muscle, the anterior scalene. Uh, and then there's some question and, and sort of controversy of what to do with the vein after that. And do you want to be uh, very aggressive, sort of like uh, the Molina group, uh, and open the vein and patch it, replace it, or do you do angioplasty? Um, what you should not do is stent them, right? So, uh, management, if you just anticoagulate, they, they recur. The patients typically, um, they can have pulmonary emboli in up to 15% of patients. Uh, you leave, basically, in all those patients, you're leaving some residual obstruction behind. Now, they could be well decompressed with collaterals, um, <clears throat> but if you don't get rid of the rib, then um, they tend to not get better. Uh, and most, most of these patients will have symptoms and some sort of disability. If you so go back to, you know, thrombolysis was first described in 93, back at UCLA, and um, very high initial success. So 93% of those patients were opened, uh, and, you know, so and there's lots of ways to do it. You know, you put an infusion catheter in, uh, we use ECOS mostly. Uh, I think there's some role for doing pharmacokinetic, uh, pharmacomechanical, so Angiojet uh, or other uh, devices. Uh, penumbra, or whatever you're comfortable using, to get the majority of the clot out at the initial phase if you can. Um, and, also, and best, the, the results are better if you do it in the first 14 days. Uh, so we talked about that already. So, you know, I, I mean, we use, I think ECOS works very well. Our radiologists actually have sort of gone away from using ECOS. They think the results are the same with just a standard infusion catheter, uh, you know, one milligram an hour. Uh, for the first six hours, then we cut it to half to half a milligram for the next sort of 12 to 18 hours. And again, sometimes you got to keep going. Um, we, you know, as, as Dr. Matt said, ultrasound got it access. The, if the basilic vein is open, that's sort of the preferred vein. Otherwise, brachial vein. You don't want to go through the cephalic because you miss the axillo, um, the axil axillary vein junction, which is, you know, and the thrombus often extends distally down the arm for some, um, certainly if it's acute, right? Um, and then you sort of get this. So here's post-lysis, and you got this sort of residual defect in the vein, and so now what are you going to do? Uh, do you want to treat it? So I think sometimes that happens. You know, we'll get uh, patients referred, and they've been lysed, and then the radiologist or cardiologist has really has sort of ballooned the hell out of it. 
Uh, and then often what happens is it reoccludes promptly after that uh, if you don't take the rib out. So I tend to lice, take rib out, then do my venous intervention, uh, often on the same approach. So, you know, you do your lysis, you leave your sheath in the arm, you take the rib out the next day, and then repeat a venogram in the room. Many times it looks better after you've done the venous venolysis and decompressed everything, it looks much better. If there's still some residual stenosis, we'll balloon it. What you, know, you do not want to do is put a stent in. You definitely don't want to put a stent in if you still have a rib because you're just going to crush the stent, right? <clears throat> uh, and then sort of decompression uh, means first rib resection, extensive venal lysis. You want to take all that scar tissue, kind of open the vein up all the way from, uh, you know, the axillary all the way to the costoclavicular junction. Um, and I didn't really put, I, I mean, I have slides on techniques, but I think that's a talk for later or for tomorrow um, where they talk about open. Um, and I think Jason's giving that, so I'm going to leave that alone. Um, you want to get the subclavius muscle, you want to get the costoclavicular ligament, um, and really get a good wide open decompression. Um, and again, this can be done transaxillary, super, I prefer supraclavicular, sometimes I'll make a medial incision, infraclavicular to get um, more medial, um, and there are techniques, uh, Molina technique to take the clavicle off and rotate the clavicle laterally to get, uh, to sort of patch onto the vena cava if you have to. Um, again, so prefer, my preference is balloon angioplasty after venal lysis. Uh, the Molina group prefers, you know, extensive patch reconstruction, uh, either using femoral vein or um, uh, when I was at WashU, we did it uh, with bovine pericardium or we used um, the cadaver vein. I mean, depending on the ex ex how, what the extent of reconstruction uh, required is. You can do a jugular vein turn down in cases where you, uh, you mobilize the jugular vein and swing it over. Um, <clears throat> that's sort of a, that's a, that's a complex and uh, you know, really the patient has to be profoundly symptomatic. And that would usually be somebody who recurs or gets very symptomatic after decompression. Uh, and then Julie Freischling's approach is sort of transaxillary decompression and leave the vein alone, they come back later and then try cross it and balloon it and treat it after. Um, you know, sort of when do you do this? So uh, I think early days of, of um, you know, when it was first described, I think Dave could say UCLA was the lysum and a coagulatum, bring them back at some period later. I think more uh, people are sort of moving towards the thrombolysis and same admission decompression. That's sort of our approach. I think that's what you do now, right? And I think that's the Stanford approach now also, right, Lizzie? Um, if you don't, you get this risk of sort of up to 30% of patients that can uh, rethrombose. Um, so we did a meta-analysis. This is uh, published by one of my residents a couple of years ago. Um, looked at uh, all literature, 18, you know, patients 18 years of old or an, an older uh, who had symptoms for uh, 14 days or less. Uh, came up, I think, with 21 papers. Uh, looked at first rib resection alone, first rib resection with intervention angioplasty, and then no rib resection. Um, it was sort of uh, it was 700 or so patients, 21 series that we reviewed, 21 met inclusion, and good numbers of patients. Uh, those are all the results, but in, this is sort of summary. First rib and first rib plus angioplasty, symptom resolution over 90% with a you know, prolonged patency, which was statistically, statistically better than when you did not remove the rib. So in conclusion, right, symptom relief was significantly better with patients who had ribs out, whether you treated the vein or not. Patency was better if you took the rib out, whether you ballooned it or not. And um, so there was really not that much difference in symptom relief with the rib resection with or without angioplasty. Um, and then if you looked at the no surgery group, almost half of those patients, 40% of those patients ultimately had surgery at some period of time. So leaving the rib in is really not uh, appropriate. Does any of you guys work anywhere where they don't do rib resections? Just do thrombolysis or it's sort of universal. Um, so that's that, right? So um, I think we basically said all that, right? <clears throat> 
So there are people uh, who don't agree, right? So Carl, Kai Johansson, I think, I, I mean, I don't know if he still believes this, but you know, they basically do lysis uh, and do observation. 80% uh, of those patients are asymptomatic, so there are some dissenters, there are some people who don't think it's necessary, but I think the data speaks for itself. <clears throat> You know, Stanford, I think this is a Jason's paper from a few years ago, and non-operative patients who they were not operated on had a high rate of recurrence uh, with a sort of almost 100 percent improvement if you take the rib out. So again, thoracic outlet decompression should be performed in all patients with venous TOS. Um, so I answer the question. Questions? So uh, that's quickly. So, uh, you know, position for a transaxillary, which I do not like. Um, supposedly it looks like this. <laughs> yeah, what it is is a tiny little hole and everything looks the same. Uh, but you can see brachial plexus, artery vein, uh, anterior scalene, and subclavius muscle. And this is supposed to be the rib. Um, Dave, you like doing them transaxillary, right? We actually have a special, uh, like, the sensory portion device here that arm suspended on there. We actually have a specialized arm over the back of the head. Yeah. And then uh, we talked to the elevator talking to the light and rest of the tractor. Yeah. And then we put the scope in there all the time, too. And, I mean, just through the stable, you can see everything. It's great. Yeah. Uh, I prefer, I prefer this approach. You know, this is actually either sub infracolicular, the supracolicular, when you notch the sternum, that gives you a nice exposure. Um, I think they're going to talk, someone else is going to talk about that. It's Tampa. All right, great. Next.